Did we used to do cold openings for the revisit it, or did we just get right into it? I haven't watched those in a long time. Uh, maybe a few of them, but I think you just got into it. Just went in hot? Yeah. Hot openings? Hot openings. Good soup. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to continue our Game of Thrones Season 6 revisited with episodes 4 and 5, Book of the Stranger and The Door. Two great episodes. I remember when these came out, they were both very well received, especially because of the endings of both episodes. We have Daenerys killing all of the cows and taking over the Dothraki, and then of course the door. It's the beginning of Bran fucking everything up for everybody. I remember when those, this is when those memes really got rolling. But like I said, these two episodes were really great standouts. I just really loved going back and getting lost in the middle of this season. Episode 4 is one of those, you forget the Daenerys storyline gets resolved rather quickly, and then she doesn't really get back into action until episode 9. And the door is just super, super fucking iconic. But you know what? These first two, they, you know, they start with the reunion between Jon Snow and Sansa. That's a moment that still holds up to this day. You remember how you felt to see those two characters together, and it's not like they were even close when they were living in Winterfell, but it's two Starks in the same place at once, and they're both safe for the moment. So that hug, you don't need any dialogue. It's just nothing that needs to be said between these two people. And that's just such a great, iconic opening scene. Yeah, I mean, for both of these characters, for John especially, it's the first family he's seen or have been around since season one with Uncle Benjamin, right? And for Sansa, the end of season one after her father is murdered and Arya leaves town. So right. um, for both of them, especially just not only their personal struggles, but the struggles of their family in the meantime. That was one of the things I like didn't like too much when it first was airing was they kind of touch on upon it a bit, but just a moment to reflect on good soup how things have changed since Winterfell with their father being uh, murdered, their brother being murdered, and things like that. So, but yeah, it was definitely an emotional reunion, especially with Sansa. Her, she had such a rough season five for her to finally have some sense of security. It just makes you feel good for that character in those moments. They definitely talk about how maybe they weren't the closest, but yeah, just that little bit of family in this time is all they need. But it quickly shifts to like, all right, Let's go home now. Yeah, and I, for John, he's ready to give up this life. He's gotten out of his vows because he was killed and came back to life. So they're headed in different directions, even though they end up in the same place. Sansa wants to fight. She says that the not only will we not be safe, but the North won't be safe with Ramsay Bolton there because most of the North still hates the wildlings. We have this threat that's coming for us all. So you can argue, yeah, Sansa is the one making the logical points here. With John, I mean, when you die and you come back to life, you can understand why he wants a little vacation. He's got the line to Ed. Where are you gonna go? South. What are you gonna do? Get warm? <laughs> it's not till later in the episode when they have the pink letter delivered to Jon Snow during the dinner scene when it's the first time Tormund starts giving sexy eyes to Brienne, which sparked another meme that lasted until the end of the show. Fun to see it adapted from the books. Obviously, the context is a little different. That's actually what inspires Jon to desert the Night's Watch in the books, and which leads to his death. Here, it's what inspires him to fight again. And he, you know, he hesitates to read the second half of the letter because it gets super graphic, but it shows how Sansa's changed, where she doesn't flinch. She, for her, these are fighting words. I want to take this motherfucker out as much as he wants to take us out. So things have changed for these characters, man. Definitely. And I think this version of the pink letter is a little watered down. Like you said in the books, there's so much more weight behind it. It's Obviously, it's a big moment here, but that being the reason John wants to desert the Night Watch, and especially because, you know, they think they have Arya. You know, they switched who was in Winterfell. It's Arya in the books, and him wanting to go back, save his sister, and that ultimately causing his demise, I think, is just done so much better in the books. But obviously, things have changed from the books to the show, and David, I think they, the way they maneuvered it was done pretty well. Like you said, that inspiring John to want to fight again. And it's a tricky situation. They basically lay it all out there. The Umbers are with Ramsay. The Rob took Lord Karstark's head, so it's going to be hard to get them on their side. 
Uh, the odds are against him here. It's not something I think Davos uh, stated that he's like, I know men, you know, they could be as loyal as you want, but at the end of the day, they're not going to choose a losing side. Yeah, they're like, how many revolted when Ramsey Bolton, when Roose Bolton killed your brother? None of them. Luckily, they do read the letter aloud in front of Tormund, so when he hears what Ramsay has planned for the Wildlings, that's, he's ready to enlist his army, and he says they've got the 2,000 fighting men. But there's also the wild card, which is Littlefinger, and uh, this is the first time we do see him this season. I totally forgot that this guy is just around at this time, you know? I think because of his storylines, his subplots became so, just weren't as interesting. Uh, and you made the point, so many people made the point at the time, why the fuck would he marry this girl off to Ramsay? Just giving up your most valuable chess piece to a guy you have no backstory on whatsoever, it's it's still so ridiculous. So that scene between Sansa and Littlefinger, it, it's kind of like Sansa speaking from the fan's perspective. What's wrong with you? You're a fucking asshole. <laughs> and you're just begging for forgiveness. Please, remember how clever I was in the earlier season? I'm still that guy. And I've got an army now. Robin Aaron still sucks. Oh, he's the worst. Um, but I guess looking at it, like, if you want to, like, consider Littlefinger this I'm ultimate... sorry to open this wound. If you want to consider him the ultimate mastermind, and if I was his <laughs> lawyer, I would say that he married Sansa knowing she would go through all these horrors and have to escape, and that's the only, re- that's the only way he can convince Lord Aaron to get the Knights of the Vale to back her and take Winterfell and improve his position, which is a lot of things have to go right, because obviously we know Ramsay is such a fucking wild card to predict that Sansa will escape, or you couldn't convince Lord Aaron to... Like, he could convince that kid to do anything at this point. So, it's something that... Poor uh, Lord Royce. Jan Royce, man. He was one of my favorite good guys of the series. He was sweating, man. <laughs> Robin Aaron was ready to throw this man out the moon door. For, like... For nothing. Speculation at most. He wasn't even paying attention. <laughs> it's like, what's that, Uncle Peter? Yeah. <laughs> oh, guess the moon door. Yeah. That, well, that's asking me you want for dinner. <laughs> Oh, well, nuggets. Dino that's nuggets, the case. Yeah. Yeah. What are you, nuts? Cook this falcon up, boy. Throw you through the moon door. <laughs> no, just kidding. Get over here. Yeah, th- she even says it's either you knew what Ramsey was or you're the stupidest man alive. And Yeah, either you're an idiot or you're my enemy. So pick a side here. Idiot? And Littlefinger immediately starts playing the, well, John's your half-brother. Yeah. Remember that. As soon as I walk away, I'm going to stop and then say it in your ear. Half-brother. Half brother. Love that accent, even though it changes all the time. <laughs> Brienne's ready to fucking kill him at a moment's notice. You know what was really gangster in this episode, too? When she confronts Melisandre and Davos, mm-hmm. she doesn't know who Davos is. She doesn't know Davos like we know Davos. I know, that's, that's what I love when all these characters meet each other. It's from Brienne's perspective, they chose Stannis, who used blood magic to kill Renly, and now they're just flip flopping ring chasers. I know. As soon as Stan has died. Brienne has no respect for these two. But obviously we know Davos to be the man. She humbles Davos by saying, Stan has admitted it when I executed him. He admitted it, you know. Who did? Stan Just before I executed him. He's got this picture of Stannis in his head that we saw many times wasn't necessarily true. I never got why he just simped Stannis so goddamn hard. It was that whole thing with the fingers. He just really respected that move. Davos is cut from a unique cloth. I don't know. He's like the Mike Airman trout to Stannis' Gus, even though Gus is so much better than Stannis. But it's like... Gus would have been sitting in the Iron Throne. Mike his hand? <laughs> yeah, Saul is master of laws? Come on. What's Walt do? He's uh, Daenerys. <laughs> Um, just ruins it. Yeah, it's so funny. It's like, oh yeah, you had to like eat rats and boil leather bounds of books in order to survive storms. And I'm gonna kill. I'm gonna I'm die for this man. Chop off your fingers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. He's like, oh, you're alive because of me. It's like, well, it's like, wow, that's Stannis. Really knows. Really has that honor about him. He plays things by the book. You got to respect that. And you see it too with uh, Sansa that her time with Littlefinger has had an impact on her. She doesn't tell John about their meeting, but she does tell him about Black. Fish. And I remember at the time thinking that Brendan was going to really just come into the fold here and be a sort of advisor like Davos was, but he's just kind of a one and done, or I think he's a two and done. He has that standoff with Jamie, and we'll talk about that when we get to that episode, and then he kind of just dies. So I remember at the time thinking, yeah, bring Blackfish into the fold. I want more of the good guys together. This feels good. You know, it feels nice. Honestly, forgot. Like, I didn't forget about Blackfish, but like... How could you? Go on then. Cut his throat. 
I just I just forgot like that happened this season that Brienne goes there and has a thing with Jamie. Right. It's just something that um, from the books. Really, nothing comes from it. But no. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a way to get Jamie out of King's Jamie Landing. Jamie threatening Edmure was fucked up. <laughs> Got super dark for no reason. He was like, geez, okay, man, we'll give you the castle. <laughs> yeah. It's like I'm going to fucking slingshot your baby into hell. Poor Edmure. <laughs> that man thought he should be king. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be fun to have yeah. that in the back of my mind rewatching that. <laughs> Sweet moment between John and Sansa when she stitches him the coat that Ned used to wear with the dire wolf sigil on it, embracing him as a Stark. Still won't call him John Stark, but. <laughs> Like, he's just as much as a Stark, even though he's a Snow. Never forget that, you're a Snow. But like I said, another sweet moment between the two, and they leave behind Castle Black. Poor Ed. Don't knock it down. Yeah, he didn't sign up for that. One of the worst jobs, I think, in Westeros. <laughs> no one's, like, trained. The, the fucking White Walkers are coming, and you're the, la- the first line of defense. Passage that always stuck with me in the books, one of the John chapters when he's reflecting on all the men that they've lost. And it, it's really just the men, the Geors, well, in the, in the show, the Alistairs, the, uh, the Halfhands, the Aemons. There's just no men anymore, you know? All the men literally have died. It's just boys and criminals and rapists, so. You ever see that meme? It's like, it's like, send dudes, and it's like, do you mean nudes? It's like, no, we're in a battle, I need men. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's true. They should just send yeah. a bunch of ravens. Send, mo- send to dudes. Cersei. Right, yes. <laughs> send dudes. That was a big thing in season one when Tyrion visits. They're like, hey, tell your queen to send us more dudes. Yeah. More dudes? She only does that for her brother. Yeah. Well, we can go to Tyrion. Yeah, we can. He is uh, still sitting on top of Marine. <laughs> I got a kick out of the slaver saying, I bought this guy once and now he's, at the, he's on top of the Great Pyramid. That Tyrion, man, he knows how to get places. The Tyrion misspeaking. Miranese, I guess. Valyrian. Valyrian, okay. Tyrion, like, his his Valyrian being bad and then the subtitles are one of my least favorite running jokes ever. Also, he's supposed to be smart, you know? I'm pretty sure in the books he knows Valyrian. At one point in the show, he knew Valyrian. There's a moment where he speaks it and it's, I forget what the context of the moment is, and it surprises people that he actually knows it. And then all of a sudden, gradually, he just gets worse and worse as, as he starts living in a place where everyone speaks Valyrian the entire continent. <laughs> So I'm just not picking this up anymore. It was better for me on Westeros. <laughs> it was fun to see him politic. I remember I enjoyed that about season six, the fact that he's back in charge and he has to make these tough choices. Masande and Grey Worm, obviously escaping from slavery, are hesitant to negotiate with the masters. Uh, his point of, listen, there's a great way to exploit people without slavery. It's called being a Lannister. Yeah, he's like, I grew up richer than any of you. <laughs> yeah, right. um, yeah it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation, obviously, from Masande's and Grey Worm's perspective. I mean, what is it, seven years or eight years that they have to... They have yeah, seven to, years. Seven years until they have to eradicate slavery. And for them, they're like, that's a long time for a fucking slave. Right. And they can't really justify it in their minds that he would even consider make, even trusting the slavers or enacting this deal. And Tyrion is basically looking at it from, a, I guess, a bureaucratic position where he knows that certain things you need to adapt and abrupt change can lead to even more conflicts. Tyrion's the, f- the ultimate moderate. Yeah, it's something where you, you, you would um, you can kind of probably make an argument for both sides. I think Masande and Grey Worm are like, well, we, this is not like we took over. Like we have Daenerys and they will enact the Queen's law no matter what. You don't and he manipulates them a bit people. though. Yeah. He manipulates them when he brings them in front of the the former slaves. And they're asking him, how could you do this? They're confronting Grey Worm and Masande and they back him up. So he kind of corners them in a way because they want to keep the peace at home. They want to keep the peace abroad. It's, you know, it's a lot of different things to juggle. And understands every word Masande saying in Valyria. I know, yeah. Then he understood it, right. It's like, that's a positive, right? She just said something that makes me look good. That I get. And, you know, he, he talks about the propaganda that they need to spread. It's not enough to keep the peace the people need to know that it's Daenerys, and that's where they bring in the Red Priestess, Kinvara. Big Kinvara fan. I felt like we didn't get enough of her. I could have used her in season seven, eight, spin off. She was just such a great character. I hope she. Everyone's like, oh, will uh, M- M- Melisandre show up in House of the Dragon? Well, she's probably just as old, too, so. Sure. Yeah, yeah no, sign me up. There's a couple other Red Priestess I spotted in that, so. And they just got the baddies, huh? <laughs> They like the hooters of religion. That's the biggest selling point for the Lord of Light. He, he's smart too, because his red priest, you have like Thoros, who's a mess. I keep the baddies and the Lord Fun drunks. Yeah. Thoros never hurt anybody. 
In Surround- fact, he brought people back to life. Yeah, so he surrounds himself with a bunch of dudes and baddies. That was a great confrontation between Varys, and they made him more of a, an agnostic, atheistic type of character in the series, which kind of replaces all the other cool and interesting things he has going on in the books. So he gets this moment here to be confrontational with the Red Priestess. He gets so shook. A lot of people seem to think it's Bran is the voice in the fire that uh, in the books they're going to start pulling back on Bran being present in a lot of these moments Mm -hmm. and if characters get distracted or if they hear things a gust of wind sort of like with Ned running up to the tower and hearing Bran in the background but nothing ever comes out of it in the show we wish that something would come out of it but and they also mentioned the whole prince who was promised right I like how he kind of undressed well even Davos to an extent with Melisandre but him yeah he's like oh you found a new one him bringing up just like yeah one of your priestesses said the same thing about Stannis and Stannis is fucking dead. So it's like you keep hitching your wagon to different people and considering them the prophet or the savior, you know. So for him, it's kind of all bullshit until she just whips out the deepest, darkest traumas that you have in the back of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a way to win an argument. It's like, um, I don't believe in your whole red god and this whole lord of light bullshit it's like remember when you shit your pants in fifth grade (laughs) (laughs) it never happened to me though okay yeah interesting just want to go on and know that didn't happen but if it did it would have been super embarrassing (laughs) not as embarrassing or as tragic as what happened to Varys. when that gets reminded when somebody knows something that intimate about your past life and your your past trauma it's just nasty you see the the facial expressions he's making it's like he's you know when you throw up in your mouth a bit and you got to pull it back (laughs) that's a face i get from rat uh from Varys here every time i take a shot now yeah it's nasty bro (sighs) it's really not fun that's good that's good stuff yeah, that's the Casamigo, so yeah. Mm. No, I don't need a lime. I don't need a lime. And we can just jump to Daenerys, what she's got going on in Face Doth Rack. Uh, before she gets back to Marine, she has to confront the cows, which she does. And this was an incredible moment. I'm not sure why one of them just didn't run up on her. Maybe if they had a do-over. <laughs> when you realize this woman's trying to set the place on fire. But the speech that she gives them about being the... Saying that she could be the one who actually rules the Dothraki. Saying they have little ambition. They're not thinking big enough. I want the entire world. So maybe this is some foreshadowing for the Mad Queen. Proceeding that that explosive and iconic moment is Daenerys stopping Dario from killing the young Khaleesi that uh, she was walking and talking with. You know, she's trying to make her feel safe trying to make her feel protected so it was nice to see that heart of Daenerys as well you know sometimes it did get lost in the later seasons even her just joking around with her like oh if only he died sooner kind of establishing that connection basically establishing that yeah they don't want to be here either they are just as much um prisoners prisoners and as she is and giving them the opportunity to kind of have a new lease on life um, she really just basically told them, the former Khaleesi's and the Cal's, I respect you all, but I'm built different. Things are different for Daenerys Targaryen. My destiny doesn't stop here. It's, I, I respect you all, and I appreciate what you're doing here, but this is mine now. <laughs> I got dragons. And that was shot so well. Yeah, when she's telling her, oh, I hear you have dragons. You're like, oh, you want to meet them? No. Three. Uh, and that's a change that people have talked about at length. Daenerys being invincible to fire. In the books, it was like a one-time deal where it was the magic of the situation uh, along with the with the pyre, with the eggs, and you had the witch. Like, everything kind of made that perfect moment. I don't mind it here. You know, Targaryens have been shown to be... You know, they have the, this, the statement in House of the Dragon that they're more gods than human. Um, I want to go that far, but they do have the supernatural type of ability in, in certain instances. Yeah, there are moments in the book where she's in a s- steaming hot bath mm-hmm. and she seems to be okay with it. Even with the Starks, they talk about that Ned Stark used to walk around Winterfell naked and uh, you know, below freezing temperatures in the middle of winter, they're just kind of fine. It's not that they're invulnerable to these conditions but the starks do better in the cold targaryens do better in the heat like you know this is obviously an extreme example but if you want to convince the dothraki to follow you this is the type of stunt you need to pull off they're not just doing anything they're just not going to follow anyone you know you need to burn down a hut and walk out naked unscathed and i think from the perspective of jorah and Daria, it is like yo this is this is a crazy ass plan even for them too just keep seeing that shit they just get blown away every single time (laughs) That was bowing. Dude, there is just something so regal about her presence. That was just such a great casting, Amelia Clark. A lot of people have been saying that about Millie Alcock as well. They would have been great buddies, the two of them. 
arguably the two best Targaryens, with what we've seen so far. I think they share a lot of those same qualities, and that's why I think people are so drawn to both of those characters. But yeah, no one can, like, when you just see her face and the flames in the background swooping across or her emerging from it, it's just... The music... So cool, so yeah. badass, and it's effortless because all she has to do is push over the fire. She doesn't need to beat you up. She doesn't need to be six foot tall. This is her magic. Love that line in season two. And what of my magic? Mm-hmm. And now it's on full display. Yeah, she walks out like a god, and that ends up doing her in because she has this hubris. She believes that she's the hero in all situations, that people are always going to bow and praise every decision that she makes, especially a decision as big as this. It would have been so funny it if worked she's, here. she's just like, thanks, Jora. Now... Remember, you're fucking banished. Right, Dario? Take care of this? I I cried twice. I teared up here. Just because of the... It's the relationship, you know? Bran and Hodor have been together since the beginning, and so have Daenerys and Jorah, you know? It's such a waste, though, like, now looking at how everything plays out, just sending him on his own way to find a cure, and the whole thing, and at uh, the Citadel. I don't know. Yeah, he doesn't even get named Hand. He was disappointed about that. I got this cure for Grayscale. You don't even name me Hand? But he had a, you know, he was one of the characters who died. More, you know, characters had to die in that episode. No, no I don't care that night. he died, but I just think you could have, like, had him along the journey with Daenerys and just have him still have grayscale and then just die and on battle. Maybe slow down the spread of it a little bit to well, make the timing know, work out, but he kind of just goes on, does his, gets the cure, and then just dies. That's a character that was improved upon his book counterpart by the showrunners so i think at this stage in their relationship it probably would have made more sense to just keep him around i'm gonna fight until i die you know i'm gonna just ride this thing out so he had to being banished twice finally comes back and saves you yeah, at that point you now gotta... go go back but this time <laughs> we're good it doesn't give him I'm any nice. money yeah can i have a ship at the <laughs> no we need those <laughs> at the cross essos by myself while dying <laughs> thanks daenerys All right, guys, before we get to the second half of this video, we're going to take a quick break to shout out our sponsor for today's episode, and that would be First Leaf. Saying goodbye to summer doesn't mean you have to say goodbye to summer's delights. And right now, you can head on over to tryfirstleaf.com slash nerdsoup to sign up, and you'll get your first six hand curated bottles for just $44.95. First Leaf takes the stress of picking the right wines out of your hands. Just answer some quick questions about your likes and dislikes on their website, and their expert team will select a customized assortment of world-class wines based on your preferences. Personally, I love white wines in the summer, but nothing beats a good red when the weather starts to cool down. Your personalized wine shipments are delivered right to your door, and all wines are priced lower than what you'd pay at the wine store. Plus, every selection is backed by First Leaf's 100% satisfaction guarantee. So, to make sure you've got great wine when you want it, you You've got to try First Leaf. Just head on over to tryfirstleaf.com slash nerdsoup to sign up and you'll get your first six hand curated bottles for just $44.95. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash nerdsoup. That's T-R-Y-F-I-R-S-T-L-E-A-F dot com slash nerdsoup to get your first six bottles for under $8 a bottle. Tryfirstleaf.com slash nerdsoup. We're back with another week of football, and DraftKings Sportsbook is keeping us in on the NFL action with great offers every single game day. New customers can bet $5 and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Throw five down on any of this week's epic matchups to walk away an instant winner. And DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every game day this September. Football's more fun when you're in on the action, so download the app now and sign up with code NERDSOUP. New customers can bet just $5 and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook. An official sports betting partner of the NFL with code NerdSoup. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY to 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, licensee partner Golden Nugget Lake Charles, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash football terms for eligibility terms and responsible gambling resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. They want this motherfucker to be every player in one. One of the best post games, can finish with both hands. Probably the best finisher with an offhand ever in NBA history. Good in the mid-range, good at three. 
but no back. One of the best passers of all time, but he doesn't tween tween has he. All right, I'm going to jump to Marjorie. One of my biggest disappointments of this season is probably Marjorie Tyrell. This is a character who was set up as the perfect adversary for Cersei, just as smart, but more graceful. You, you, you're more drawn to that character because of her outward appearance, but in the inside, like I said, she's just as conniving, just as intelligent. And it seems like this that I, I think it's a good scene. High Sparrow's trying to get Marjorie on his side because he knows that Tommen is obsessed with this girl, and that's going to strengthen his position against Cersei, knowing that they have this sort of natural rivalry anyway. But a moment where Marjorie has memorized the passages that are being read to her by Septa and Ella, it highlights her intelligence, and I wish she had more of an opportunity in this season to play the game like she was in those earlier seasons when we were introduced to her she was the only one who was able to tame joffrey and now it's you know she's not sitting behind the chessboard anymore she's being moved around right so i wish this character could have gotten more and i think it's a it's a great moment for cersei at the end but it sucks that she went out that way and i hate how that she puts it together cersei understands the consequences of her absence and she is absent anyway which means she does not intend to suffer those consequences that doesn't do anything for me. She's still gonna get fucking blown to bits. But this was a good scene between her and the High Sparrow. Yeah, I talked about it last time. Jonathan Price as his character is one of the better performances in the whole series. He's just so fucking... It's so easy to hate the way he delivers every line. Like, even though he's this older man who really doesn't seem like a threat, he just can puts the fear of the seven gods in you but like in the softest way possible and he's got nothing behind those eyes yeah it's a friendly face but it's also super dark the story that he's telling about his uh upbringing when he was spending his money committing sins all that stuff it just, it just doesn't feel he he delivers it and i imagine yeah, that it seemed if like he was a fun guy yeah and it also seems like he's just making it up you know if you're susceptible to that you can fall for it but it just seems like a story he's told millions and millions of times to the point where it's become true for him. He's the ultimate manipulator. Yeah, uh, cult leader, in this con show. artist. Yeah, like, he's just such a con artist. Because I'm listening to him talk and I'm like, man, I can listen to you all day. <laughs> Keep going. All of a sudden, I've got the fucking yeah. scar in my head. God, he is the perfect, like we talked about, adversary for like Cersei and just for anybody in general. He just. That was a brilliant move. Yeah. That's why Cersei's arc is so strong up until season eight, because it's this throughout season six, her trying to defeat the Sparrows. And that's a great scene when they're teaming up. I got chills with Olena and Cersei. I was like, yeah, man, let's go. This is Bloods and Crips putting aside <laughs> their differences. Yeah, that's always, that, that got me too. Just having them have the same goal and like, that would be unstoppable. It's so weird. Like when you, <laughs> all these people, all these great minds and leaders and if they just work together, Westeros would just be a paradise <laughs> because everyone's just so goddamn obsessed with power and trying to one up each other and maneuver that everything just devolves into chaos. She tells Kevin Lannister, don't you want your son back? Right. So she gets him back on uh, their side. Jamie's got this game plan. We're just going to show force, right? Nothing needs to, nothing too bloody needs to happen. Preferably the High Sparrow will be dead and Marjorie will be safe. With Tommen, all things good. It was, uh, you know, you're wondering how the hell was Cersei going to get herself out of this one in this season. It wasn't such a foregone conclusion that she was going to overcome the threat of the Sparrows. You imagine Cersei being the more important character. Right. But at this point, the Sparrows, as hated as any villain in the history of the show, up there with Ramsay and Joffrey, and led even, by the High Sparrow. Even the thing like letting Marjorie see Loras, like, that's just part of his game as well. That was an emotional scene, seeing them together. Just seeing how broken Loras was, was really sad. Like he says, like he doesn't know if he can keep fighting or if he's not strong enough. We obviously know how that ends and he finally does succumb, but it was just an emotional moment just to see them back together for so you really don't know how long they've been in this these cells for you don't know the last time they even had out, outside contact besides septo elena and the high sparrow so right and poor marjorie she's telling loris what the plan is and loris is saying scratch that just get me the hell out of here she's thinking in her mind i've been enduring this he can endure this for a little bit longer but he's just so much weaker even though he's the obviously the better sword fighter and he's stronger he's got that reputation mentally the man is cooked broken Marjorie's ready to fight back. As soon as she, it's like an animal gnawing off their leg. She's hopping around, swinging. Uh, so it's it's the difference uh, between those two characters caught in that that moment. He's probably dead in the books too, anyway. So doesn't make me too, feel too bad about what happens to him. Once he died, he got like boiling oil poured on him at Storm's End. He might still be kicking. I don't know. 
I don't, I don't like Loris anyway. I don't care. Speaking of a character I do like, though, uh, Osha. Oh, yeah. Nice to see her back, and she's gone. She can't. Need to make Ramsey evil. One back to her evil. bag of tricks. <laughs> Just gonna try and seduce him and stab him. Is there a man less seducible than Ramsey Bolton? <laughs> yeah, that was never gonna work. I think that's just, that pisses me off. That was a lazy moment to kill off a character to establish Ramsey further as the terrible guy that we're all supposed to hate. Here's a beloved character from the earlier seasons and she's gone, like I said. Yeah, I think there's a few deaths in these episodes that were just flash in the pan, like, oh, okay, that was unnecessary, but what are you gonna do? I think when he's talking about Theon and kind of how he just got every ounce of information out of him, and then when we see Theon later on, I thought that was actually pretty cool, just to see how Theon, obviously he's still struggling with the torture and torment by the, at the hands of Ramsay, seeing him kind of stand up for himself a bit, especially during a king's mood, and be able to actually publicly speak with some semblance of confidence is, I think, such a big step for that character. But, um, yeah, Ramsay... Gallivanting. That's the sort of thing you start to say once your dick gets chopped off. <laughs> Don't get... I, we don't want to go to that. I fucking hate you, Ron Greyjoy. <laughs> I thought that was a funny line. He is annoying. I don't like him in this scene. Could have been a better introduction. But at this point, there was something that we were still holding on to. Maybe this character will be... Uh, have some semblance to his book counterpart. We talked about it when we about on the last episode, just like he's just a fucking guy. No, he's just a dude. No, he doesn't show up and steal the show. Why not just dress him up like he is in the book? That could have gone such a long way. Well, just have just him give him a cool get up. Have him be smarter, say cooler things. Like he didn't do anything. Like it's literally just Theon and Yara making excellent points and his response is you ain't got no dick and everyone's like yeah dude jokes sell i think twitter's proven that that jokes are more important than the truth sometimes if you can he's just ratioing that <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just real-time ratios no dick plus You're wrong. plus women plus ratio yeah right plus no ships and it just goes back to like the iron islands never had a queen before just the reluctance even seeing it now with the house of the dragon and rhaenyra struggles trying to iron islands makes way more sense though i wouldn't if i was a woman i wouldn't but even no, bother seems... i wouldn't even be offended these people are but it's one of those garbage. things where they're actually even but they train their women to be yeah they do li they like do. to lead ships and lead men and yara's done that time and time again nothing they they say is false like they make great points it's not like he comes in looking like a fucking a slob a slob a, a slob <laughs> you didn't even fucking comb your hair man it's a king smooth doesn't make one good point just talks about how theon has no dick and i got i got a big talk <laughs> he makes a good point about daenerys well what a, and they kind of stole his what idea a brilliant idea <laughs> Hey, they stole it. They Zuckerberg him. It's like the person saying, I'm going to cut taxes and you're going to get this. And like, he's feeling all yeah, these I like promises. That. I like that. That's appealing to me. At least in the books, he comes out, you know, looking sick, eye patch. He condemns got, terrorism. Got these fucking warlocks. I'm drinking the milk too. Basically, I'm showing that he's on acid. And, <laughs> but he has like this, dra he has a dragon horn. Right. That's cool. Well, they were never going to do anything with that. So it really does suck. He didn't have a selling point. At least, like, he has this dragon point. He looks sick. But yeah, like, the ultimate point is, like, you've been gone this whole time and Yara's been leading us. <laughs> I started laughing to myself when Theon walks in the room to meet Yara for the first time in so long. She's very mean to him. G she should be. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. He, I'm not saying Theon. I fucking hate Theon, too. Yeah, I know. All he's of a sudden, you're a Theon sympathizer. He's never been redeemed, but, like, This I man mean, straight up fingered his sister in that first season. Second season. He didn't know. What well, times have changed for this guy, man. The only living son of Balon Greyjoy. But like, after what he's been through, and she's just like, stop crying. My like, God, just give him a break. <laughs> she just makes fun of him a lot, too. Right, well, you know, he, she has this expectation that he's come back to claim the throne. And he's like, are you fucking nuts? You think I want to rule? I just want to be somewhere. I just want to be your buddy. I want to have some one friend. I would, I would have taken my chances with John and King's Landing to go back to the goddamn Iron Islands. You're a Greyjoy, and a Stark. <laughs> and wild way to coronate your king, just to drown him. I know. That's how they do it, though. You have to come back to life. I would have stuck around if I was Yara. It's like oh, he could die, and I'll just be queen. Yeah, but then you, you know, you don't have that head start. <laughs> oh fuck, he's getting back up. What if he just died? You're like, all right. I guess right. you don't well, take you the chance. Just, you just yeah. come back. Wait, I can't imagine they're going to King Smoot right after. That's, a big, go that's a big ordeal. you got to plan that. Catering company? No, everybody stay. Everybody stay. We're doing it again. We got Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Man, that Arya stuff in Bravos is so goddamn boring. 
even on rewatch, I'm like, just get back to Westeros already. My goodness. It was funny I seeing just... Richard E. Grant. Yes, it was. <laughs> what the hell is he doing there? And fake Sansa again. She's terrific. Yeah, I wish yeah. we could have seen more of her. She's good. Maybe a spinoff. One of the funniest jokes that came out of this episode was that Arya was watching the play and playing herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's in the crowd watching Ned get executed. It never gets old. Well, I, I just my but, problem is that she's enjoying the hell out of this play. Like she doesn't know what's coming next. She's just having the best time of her life. Like, oh, there's my d- oh, it's I I hate that. I I, I found that to be stupid. <laughs> it, it is funny how they gave him that accent that he's an idiot. Ned. Yeah, it's just they're racist towards the Northerners. We men of the North are right good hands at keeping people lawful. Well, how are Cersei and Joffrey the good guys in this play? Tyrion's the bad it's guy. It's real history. You know. I mean, their whole, their <laughs> timelines are all mixed up. Tyrion yeah. wasn't there. No. You're literally like the book readers. <laughs> <laughs> that is not how it went down. I was there, trust me. I don't know. I think it's just, it was, um, it's whatever. Every was- scene with Jack and Hagar, a girl has no name, a girl has no desires. Oh my goodness. It's so pretentious at this point. It's not cool anymore. They lost all the cool factor from the earlier seasons, man. Obviously with season five, there was some mystery there. You know, she's going on over the house of black and white. What the hell is going on in there? But at this point, we just know what it is. You know, she's got to learn how to be a killer. She's got to learn how to be an assassin. She has to assassinate this nice lady. Yeah, R.I.P. Lady Crane. Right. She did t- Yeah, the wave cuts fucking guts her. <laughs> the fuck is wrong with the waif, man? <laughs> She's a weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> she is a weirdo. <laughs> I don't like her. Nice reference to the winds of winter as well. Yeah. I feel the winds of winter as they lick across the land. And our son alone on that cold, cold throne without a guiding hand. Still hasn't came. Yeah, this is 2016. <laughs> I should have done a Hamilton version of how the events of Westeros. I saw Hamilton, by the way. <laughs> well, you know who else probably saw Hamilton? Bran, because that man could see anything. And these are the scenes that I wish we would have been getting throughout season five. How much better would Bran's story have been if we were doing more of this in season five? If they were opening up the lore, didn't have to be a lot. Not and yet. leading into this confrontation with the Night King, which is one of my favorite moments with the White Walkers, but it just feels like something we should have gotten more of. This is the peak of his abilities in terms of how they visualize it and present it on screen. And instead of building off of this, they kind of shied away from it. I know. You obviously get the moments when he sees John being born, but that's more of him just watching. There's no interactiveness. There's no... Like, this really had you question you know, how time works within this world now and makes you reconsider some things and kind of creates a paradox and gets really super into these, like, I don't know, it gets in your head where you just get into the, the more you think about it, the more you get confused about it. And then it just becomes pretty straightforward. Oh, he could see through time. There's there's no confusion. There's no surrealism. There's no element that makes you sit back and go, wow, what's going on here? Right. They introduce the concept of basically time travel of infinity of things continuously happening so Bran was always going to be there for Hodor in his childhood and Hodor was always going to die this way so it is a yeah it's an interesting sci-fi type of element to the story that wasn't always necessarily there it was hinted at through visions and prophecies I'm not saying you have to go get super into it but it makes you think like well it's not even that big of a determinism based just you can (laughs) keep it like separate to just Hodor how he lost all agency in that moment and his whole life was going to end up to the same thing. Um, It's fun to think about. Yeah. And I think these powers lend itself to those sort of philosophical ideas that get your brain turning a bit. But it's, like you said, they were hesitant to go back to it to introduce any of these cool, surreal ideas that, you know, when you do play with this type of magic, you open yourself up to maybe plot holes and some of the logic doesn't really add up. But for here, it worked. So Yeah, no, it worked very well. But even like look at Watchmen the HBO show, or even the Zack Snyder film, like the omnipresent Dr. Manhattan, like things like that, where I think in the HBO series, when he's just everywhere at once, kind of living through different versions and different times, like that shit was fucking cool. Right. Yeah. And that seems like, oh, it was kind of headed that way with Bran, but then it just becomes very surface level. Really, it's just to move the story forward. It's these bits of information that we need about characters that is 
been teased for a long time, but if you would have kept some more things for the books, I think there could have been more things for Bran to do in these scenes with the Three-Eyed Raven. But, you know, this first scene, we get the creation of the Night King. It's the first White Walker who was created by the Children of the Forest. I don't know if, how satisfied people were with that explanation when it came out. It seemed kind of almost anticlimactic with the it's, way they built up the White Walkers, well, th- where it's just, yeah. we were at war with men, so we created this weapon. I think that's what happens, and I think people's reaction to that were, like, okay, but like, since then. But that ended up just being it, right? No, that's that's just it. That's their origin. If they never back, go back to it. Yeah, and every, like that's this is a bigger moment now, in hindsight, than it was when we first saw it, because this ends up just being the last bit of information we get on the White Walkers. What do they want? Nothing. They're a nuclear bomb gone wrong. I also don't hate the idea, because I think George is going to do it differently. I think he, he's going to have position Euron. This is obviously people have speculated on this. He's going to position Euron as the Night King of his story, where he lets the monsters through the wall, and it's something they have to deal with. And I don't hate the idea of men trying to forget the horrors of their ancestors. They try and bury this past, and the past resurfacing in such a frightening way. The White Walkers, the power that they've been setting up all this time. I don't hate that. So even if it, you know, if they never went beyond it, I think what what really ends up fucking the White Walkers is the way they were used in season eight, where you know they've been building them up for so long, and they lost all of that. They they you no longer feared them. You no longer anticipated that these were people that no one could defeat one on one. Yeah, you get that great moment with Jon Snow, but it was a desperate moment with Valyrian Steel. You know, they just become mascots, really, by season eight. They're just walking slowly, and the design is still really cool. But see, this is a moment where it's like, these are still the White Walkers. You know, they're badass. You don't really understand their magic, but they just give off this super powerful vibe that, like, you know, it's it's desperate when they show up. You have to do every, you, you know, summer dies. Uh, oh, I hate that, man. Such a dumb way to kill summer. He bought them time. He did, they needed that time, man. They were closing in. You think if summer doesn't buy them that time, they get out of that door? Yeah, because Leaf does the self destruction thing with the grenade. Summer bought them some yards. That matters. It's a game of inches. Uh, it's just such an ins- I, You know what? I forgot that he died. The way they treat dire wolves, like, <laughs> it's like summer everyone loves oh ghosts this ghost that ghost this summer is far and away more important than ghosts in the grand scheme of things summer is brands go back to even early in this the series his connection with summer and his working abilities that's how it's shown right we barely even see summer after that and then it just um they just end it with him going this is the stupidest he didn't even kill a white walk uh didn't even kill a white just jumped in a pile and they definitely stabbed. could have wrote it where he just runs ahead with them we need to do something cool have but the, it's also brand have them reanimate summer in a way i'm not saying i Fight support ghost. summer dying yeah. but this was brand shedding his childhood hodor's gone jojen's gone summer's gone the three-eyed raven's gone and i think that visually the way he died was so so cool yeah just fucking dissipates and mira Leave, low, low key white walker killer i got so hyped when she did that the first time i watched this man it was it was so satisfying back in the day to see characters kill white walkers those were always such great moments dude Sam, when he kills the White Walker with the dragon glass dagger, that's such a scary fucking scene, dude. This fucking ice demon's about to kidnap your baby. The way he's walking, it's like a ghoul, it's like a ghostly figure, and out of nowhere, the, the most unlikely of heroes kills him. It's the same thing with Jon Snow, he's running around, he's out of breath, he's desperate. Oh, look, the sword that Gior Mormon gave me seasons ago is here, maybe this will work. It did? But now, yeah, and the same thing with Mira here, you know, they're being surrounded, they're, they're suffocated by the whites, and then here come the fucking big daddies and eat this, motherfucker. You got that sense of, of hype. I like when he's like, uh, my... <laughs> It's like, you will become the three-eyed raving now. It's like, am I ready? No. <laughs> yeah, do you think you're fucking ready? We've been doing this for two days. You literally just blew up our spot. Yeah, but I got paid. Max von Sydow. People were uh, upset about that recasting, saying, oh, why, you know, the show's gotten more popular, so now you need to bring in a more recognizable name. I don't know how recognizable he is for the young folks, but I think to see a legend like that, especially now it being one of his last roles, was... yeah. It's awesome now to look back on it. And I always say young Max uh, Von Sado would be such a great Brendan Rivers. Be perfect for that character. 
But the spectacle of this moment was awesome. Uh, the way it leads into the Hodor moment where the children of the forest, the remaining children of the forest are throwing the firebombs. The White Walkers don't give a fuck. They're just walking in real cool. This was when it was cool when they would walk that way. You yeah. Know? No, no, that scene still gets me when Hodor gets... It's such a... That left me like... like it, it, I had to take a few minutes when I first saw that. And even watching it again, it's just very tragic. Basically, his whole life has been about this very moment. And he's such an innocent and pure character. Right. A fan favorite, the big teddy bear of the group. And earlier in the episode, just laughing and thinking about having eggs fried in butter with the rations of blood sausage and bacon. Like, Damn, that does sound good. Yeah, I could go for that. It's, a, it's always tough when the characters who are pure of heart have to sacrifice themselves in that way. That's what he was always there to do for Bran. He was Bran's ultimate protector since the beginning of the series. And I think that's why it hits so hard emotionally because you remember those early days of Bran and Rickon and Osha of Hodor trying to escape, just trying to find a lifeline, so desperate to survive. And it's all come to this moment where Bran is expected to be the new Three-Eyed Raven, a very important position. It's basically paid off, but you still have something to give. And uh, the way they filmed it, man, with him the slow motion, the stabs, yeah. the music. This man was literally able to warg time. And <laughs> never, it never even happened again. And the look like, on Brand's face like is... Kung Fury is like, I'm gonna, it's like I gotta hack time. It's hacking time. <laughs> hack you through the past <laughs> he really did just hack time uh and the, the look on his face that he, when he realizes what he has to do it's so sad you know you're in your home through this memory and you're going to do this to somebody who's been with you since you were a baby you know it's, even when you're having a good thing things go bad in this world <laughs> Uh, so you just it's just all around it's just cinematic epic and then it becomes super sad and tragic like you said man and of course hold the door hold the door hold the door hold door hold door yeah that boy george been cooking shit up not recently no yeah it's, it's such a great moment like even talking about season six as a whole um i feel like this often gets even the daenerys moment gets left out because the ending of the season is so fucking strong that's kind of a testament to the sea like these episodes are like represent the season as a whole where the the mo like maybe some of the smaller moments aren't that right but when they need to do something big they fucking deliver on it a hundred percent Game of Thrones is always destined to go Hollywood. That's the story that George was setting up. Before Daenerys goes crazy, she's gonna come north. Together with Jon Snow, they're gonna defeat the White Walkers. So this is the season where they really start to dip their toe. Not even dip their toe, dive right on in to what Hollywood is and its spectacle. Those moments throughout this season is what makes it such a favorable season for fans. Like you said, people just there's so many great moments, big moments in this ep uh, in this season that that pay off all the development they've been doing for a long time. And of course, we will be back for episodes six, seven, and eight. We're going back to the three episode review, and then we'll be doing Battle of the Bastards and the Winds of Winter individually. So that should be fun, man. Uh, I'm getting into it. I always said I wouldn't go back and rewatch Game of Thrones, but this revisited is making me want to start from the beginning. So, but I'm probably just going to watch all of One Piece instead. Wow, that was probably our best review yet. Hey guys, Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video. Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stick stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind the scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make nerd soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits. <laughs>